Hey guys, there's been a lot of hubbub the last week or two over some of the things coming out when the U.S. Supreme Court uh, had this bombshell released. They didn't really release it, right? Somebody probably should go to jail for what happened. Nonetheless, when the story was covered in Politico about Justice Alito and, and, and his position being actually against Roe versus Wade, saying, let's go back to the Constitution and actually do what the Constitution says, which I know, novel idea, but would be a really great thing. And then has now started a lot of fires and people uh, apparently buildings, businesses, pants, I don't know, where they're freaking out over what's going on. Let me walk through this. There are many conservatives right now who are acknowledging the truth that if Roe versus Wade is overturned, it goes back and becomes a state issue. It doesn't end abortion, but what many conservatives are saying that I think is fundamentally wrong is they are saying that when this goes back to the states, that's the way it should be under the Constitution. I'm gonna fundamentally disagree, and the reason why is under the Constitution, it does not allow states to vote to say murder is legal in their state because, well, the Constitution doesn't speak to it. That's a state's rights issue. No, there's some fundamental things that we know to be true in America. Go back to the Declaration of Independence, things that we understood that there was a God, that God gave rights to man, and government's job was to protect those rights. Among those rights is a right to life. That's why murder is going to be wrong in all 50 states. It's not a state's rights issue, even though it's not explicitly explained in the Constitution. But that's the argument. People say, well, if the Constitution doesn't specifically speak to it, then it should belong to the states. That's not the way the Founding Fathers believed, and it's not what they intended in our government. And I know when we're talking about abortion, a lot of people say, but this was something the Founding Fathers never could have imagined. This is where I want to do a dive back into history. I've got several artifacts we're going to walk through. And let me actually start start with early political philosopher John Locke. John Locke is considered to be one of the most significant influences on the Founding Fathers, specifically if you look at the Revolution period. He was the most quoted, cited individual from the Founding Fathers during the American Revolution. If you expand that time frame, go forward to the Constitution, go forward to early America under the Constitution, he becomes the third most significant political commentator. But during the time of the Revolution, he's the most important. And in his two treatises of government, one of the things he explains is that under the king, people said, well, the king can do whatever he wants because it's divine right of kings and he's from God and he speaks for God. And there actually was some English writers who took that position. And John Locke wrote the first treatise of government back, which is those two treatises, but the first treatise contained in this book, he goes through and says, you've totally misunderstood the way government works, the way God created things. And John Locke does a Bible lesson going through and just explaining Here's how God made things to work. Starts in Genesis when God made Adam and God made Eve, and he unfolds the way that governments should function based on how God created things. The reason that's significant is he actually gets into parents and children. Let me read you a small passage from John Locke. And, and, and this is in, it's number 56. It's of civil government, but it's talking about Adam and Eve. It says, Adam and Eve, and after them, all parents were by the law of nature under an obligation to preserve, nourish, and educate the children they had begotten, not as their own workmanship, but as the workmanship of their own maker, the Almighty, to whom they were to be accountable for them. John Locke says one of the things you need to understand is that God made parents, and it starts with Adam and Eve, but then all parents, they're accountable. He says accountable to preserve, nourish, and educate. Now, preserve means to keep them alive. John Locke identified that parents are supposed to keep their kids alive. They're supposed to educate them. They're, they're supposed to help take care of them. And not because it's just something they've done. Like my wife and I, we made a baby. No, because they recognized, John Locke recognized, because that's something God gave to you. God entrusted that child to you and you're responsible to take care of that child. Well, well this was John Locke's position. Now, again, the reason I'm pointing this out, John Locke, very influential on the founding fathers. One of the other individuals, William Blackstone, he wrote Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England. And in one of his volumes, he actually gets into children as well, but this one goes into even greater detail. So John Locke identified that God is the one who gave us kids and that parents' job is to preserve and, and nurture and to educate children. Blackstone goes even further in an interesting legal direction because one of the things he identifies, he says, life is the immediate gift of God, a right inherent by nature in every individual, and it begins in contemplation of law as soon as the infant is able to stir in the mother's womb. Now he says, by law, 
That's when life begins. When the infant is first able to stir in the womb, he continues, for if a woman is quick with child and by potion, meaning she drinks a poison, or otherwise killeth the child in her womb, or if anyone beat her, whereby the child dieth in her body. So, right, someone punches the mother in the stomach and the child dies. He goes on to say that this was by the anti-law homicide or manslaughter. They're responsible for the death of that child, he says, because that child is protected by the law. In fact, on the very next page in the following paragraphs, he says, an infant in the mother's womb is supposed in law to be born for many purposes. He said, even though this child has not yet been born, we recognize they are an actual living person according to the law. And he goes on to explain that they can inherit property and they can have stewards put over them. And, and there's a lot of things legally they're recognized as being a real person. Again, the reason this matters is when you look at some of the major influences of the founding fathers and their legal and political philosophy, John Locke starts off saying that children come from God and parents' job is to preserve them, to nurture and educate them. William Blackstone says that if a mother is pregnant and, and she drinks a potion, meaning that intentionally she tries to kill the baby in her, or if somebody comes up and strikes her and the baby dies, those persons are guilty of the death of that child because they recognize even though the child is not born, it does have legal standing under the law. That's where the political philosopher started, but let me go even further, because if you look at the founding fathers themselves, James Wilson was one of only six founding fathers to sign both the Declaration and the Constitution. After signing the Constitution, once the Constitution was ratified, he was appointed by George Washington to be on the U.S. Supreme Court. He also wrote some of the very first, what, what became known as the first law books in America. Specifically, he wrote law lectures, and he gave these lectures at a law school, and they took those law lectures, and they made them into law books, and it's a three-volume set. This is one of the volumes, but this is one of the lectures he gave to his law students, again, dealing with this issue of unborn life, or pre-born children. Here's what he said. With consistency, beautiful and undeviating, human life from its commencement to its close is protected by the common law. In the contemplations of law, life begins when the infant is first able to stir in the womb. By the law, life is protected, not only from immediate destruction, but from every degree of actual violence, and in some cases, from every degree of danger, meaning that according to the law, that there are certain things that mothers shouldn't be doing because it brings danger to the child, and that child, even though not yet born, that pre-born, that unborn child, is protected by the law. Now, this is in America. This is the, the first organized law training going on in America, right? These are the first law books in America. And he's saying to the lawyers of America that the law of America protects the right of unborn children. Why? Well, he further goes on to explain it's part of the common law. Common law is how we operated with the basic laws whereby we knew that murder was wrong, but murder not only of people outside of the womb, but murder of people inside the womb. And he's not the only founding father to get into this. Another founding father that's a, a very easy example is John Witherspoon. He was the president of Princeton University. As the president of Princeton, he was one of the primary instructors, gave many lectures. This is one of his volumes of some of the lectures he gave. And in the lectures he gave, let me read you part of what he told the students. And in the top of this page, it says, some nations have given parents the power of life and death over their children. Now think about that for a second. Some nations allow parents actually to control whether their children live or die. That's what he's talking about. He goes on in this and explains in the next two paragraphs that in some nations, they believe that, that children are really just property that the parents own and the parents can do with them what they want. They can disregard them. They can sacrifice them. They, they can sell them. They can do whatever they want with them. As he goes down several paragraphs later, he then concludes that since we have denied the power of life and death to parents, it will be asked, what is the sanction of their authority? Now, meaning that people are going to say, well, if parents don't have the power of life and death of their children in America, what can they do? But let's just unfold that thought for a second. He said that parents don't have the power of life and death over their children in America. That's correct. In America, according to common law, unborn children were protected. And people today think, wait a second, abortion's a brand new idea. Abortion is not a brand new idea. For literally hundreds or thousands of years, 
people knew that there were certain potions you could drink that would kill the child. They knew there were certain things you could do. You could strike the woman being pregnant, it would murder, it would kill that child. Literally, abortion is not a brand new thing. Technology has changed. And, and with technology's changed, the way that abortions are done certainly are different. Still, every bit is evil, sometimes maybe even more evil in some of the ways that some of the modern procedures are done. Nonetheless, abortion is not a new idea. But the reason, again, I bring this up is there are many people looking at the U.S. Supreme Court saying, man, if they overturn Roe versus Wade, abortion will go back to the states where it should have been all along. No. Even in the states, abortion never should have been protected because it always violated the basic premise of law in America that governments exist to protect your right to life. And life does not start after you are outside your mother's womb. Life actually begins when you are inside the mother's womb. Now, if we want to get into the discussion of when does life actually begin, is it, is it at conception? Is it the heartbeat? Is it right at 20 weeks? Like We can have that discussion, and I have a pretty strong position on that. But the point is, it's very clear in common law that life absolutely begins in the mother's womb. That is very clearly a human being that has not yet been born. It is still a human being. So even if the U.S. Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade, which we all pray they do, and it goes back to states, and there are many states that already have trigger laws in place, that if Roe versus Wade is overturned, they're going to end abortion in their states. Praise God for those states. And by the way, would I encourage you, Check with your state legislature. See where your state is and encourage your state legislators, your state representatives, your state senators. Even talk to your congressmen. Let them know we want to see abortion ended because we don't want to see more babies murdered. With it being said, this is where we want to make sure as we're looking at America, we understand the limitations of the Constitution, but also the reality of American law and common law. Just because things are adopted today doesn't mean it's the way they should be, and it's certainly not the way it used to be. When people say that, well, this always should have been a state's rights issue, no, that's kind of like saying slavery always should have been a state's rights issue. No, slavery always should have been wrong. There's some things that always should have been wrong, and even though it's not explicitly in the Constitution, it still shouldn't be tolerated in the states.